Kaya? Jupin Nunuk Jinani, Nala Katajini, Nunga Mot Badaya Ken Karak Nija Buja. I respectfully acknowledge the past and present traditional custodians of this land on which we are meeting, the Nungo elders and people. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth event in the West Australian ECU lecture series. And our event tonight features our very own Professor Moira Sim, head of the School of Medical Sciences. And Professor Sim will speak on the topic, which I totally agree with, overdiagnosis, making well people sick. And actually, this is a special one because, of course, it's in the middle of research week here at ECU. Now, each month, the West Australian ECU lecture series provides a forum for an ECU professor to discuss a pressing, pressing issue facing our community, outline their research in the area, and engage in discussion with colleagues and the public. Because it is the job of a professor to what, David? Profess, profess correct. <laughs> research not made public by, pub by publishing it or talking about it is not research. And ECU is very proud to partner with the West Australian in this exciting series. So let me just give you a little background on Moira before we introduce her to deliver her talk. As I mentioned, she's head of the School of Medical Sciences at ECU. And Moira is a unique academic whose expertise is in translation and connection, bridging the gap between clinical practice, research, and the community. Actually, one thing that is astonishing is that she can speak Welsh. Isn't that amazing? Of course, we all know that as one of the most important international languages that you can use around the world. She's a general practitioner and a specialist addiction medicine, med medicine physician with 30 years of clinical practice and is an established leader, educator, innovator and change agent in the health sector. Moira has worked to increase access to care through professional education, through advocacy and system change, through many roles. And I've, as I've mentioned, she's particularly skilled in languages, which are a hobby for her. Moira speaks five languages fluently. I mentioned one language she speaks as Welsh. I'm not sure how fluent she is, but she's fl fluish also in a very, another very important international language, Danish, which of course we all need to know. And actually reads novels in another four. So that's nine languages. That, that's pretty amazing. That's an, a special brain that can do that. Today, her topic uses these language skills to translate a complex topic into messages that are relevant to each of us. So in Moira's presentation this evening, she'll explore the fascinating issue of overdiagnosis. And following her talk, I'm going to let you ask her questions. We'll have a question and answer session. Uh, and you'll, there'll be a mic floating around that. So I'm going to introduce Moira in a minute. But just before we do that, this is a big day for Moira because it's her birthday. And so I hope your voices are in good fettle, because what we're going to do is we're going to, it's a big one for her, it's her 30th today, so we're going to sing happy birthday to her. Are you ready? Yes. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Moira, happy birthday to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Moira Sim. As a society, we've come a long way in the past 100 years. We live longer, we're healthier, we've got better access to health care and better health outcomes than at any previous time in history. So why am I talking about overdiagnosis and suggesting it makes well people sick? Everyone knows that if you get an early diagnosis and treatment, it makes good sense. But I'm going to show you that getting a diagnosis is not always beneficial. Some diseases were never going to cause us a problem in our lifetime. And living with a diagnosis, getting side effects from treatment, especially if it doesn't work, might be worse. Here's what I'm going to cover. How we make a diagnosis, what overdiagnosis is, how it happens, why it's a problem, 
tests are useful, but what do they really tell us and what are their limitations? Then I'm going to use some examples of cancer tests to illustrate overdiagnosis. From then, I'll discuss an approach to thinking about tests and what we can do about it. And lastly, I'm going to put all that in the context of our health generally and what we can do about it. The first concept I want to cover is that of diagnosis in medicine. Diagnosis is all about identifying the cause of the symptoms. The purpose is to get the right treatment and sometimes access to the right services. Diagnosis can give us a sense of safety and certainty and relief. But there are shades of grey in diagnosis and myths about our ability to test for disease. As a GP, I commonly see people who come in to ask for a general checkup, and then they ask, I'd like to be tested for everything. Now, there are two myths here. One, that it's possible to be tested for everything, and two, that it's good to be tested for everything. I'm going to explore both those myths tonight. Let me give you some background on how doctors are trained to make diagnoses. There are three things, history, examination, and investigations that we use. History is the time-honored method, which starts with listening to the patient, to their story. What did this person notice or feel? What are they thinking about and what are they concerned about? From here, we create a hypothesis we have some working ideas about some possible diagnoses. And that includes the most probable diagnoses, as well as the rare conditions, which we must not miss, what we call the red flag conditions. And these were, of course, what we were taught to think of first in medical school. Then the next step is examination. At this step, what we do is we're looking for signs. We observe the person, we lay hands on the person to feel, to, mo to move, to look and to listen. The purpose here is to confirm or disprove suspicions. The suspicions that we've had from the history and we're narrowing down the diagnosis to a select few to what we call the differential diagnosis. Then the last step is investigations. This is all about testing the hypothesis. That is, I have an idea, and I'm going to do a test to check if my idea or ideas is correct. An important point here is that investigations are not always needed. The diagnosis might be obvious, and experience is the only test that we'll need. We can also use time as a diagnostic tool. If I'm right, this will be gone within three days. If it's not gone, please come back. We'll need to think about what else it could be. Or we could use treatment as a diagnostic tool. If I'm right, this cream should make it go away within two weeks. And if it's not gone, please come back because we need to take a biopsy to work out what's going on. And whether we investigate very much depends on personal preferences. Each patient is different. Some people prefer to know, some people prefer to let nature take its course. Other health conditions that might take priority or social issues that might make people say, I prefer to have this test now or not. So that's how we get to the diagnosis. This stepped process is very important because without that, the tests make no sense. In the high-tech world we live in, people think often that tests are better and more accurate. But the tests can only answer yes, no, and maybe. You actually have to know what the question is for the answer to make sense. In medicine, we constantly ask ourselves if we have the diagnosis right and review those thoughts using history, examination and investigations, constantly refining that diagnosis because over time, new information comes on board that should make us wonder, is, is the diagnosis different? Could this be something else or should I just be blaming this on that particular diagnosis? So time, the effect of treatment and feedback tell us if we're on the right track. So in the case of the person who wants to get tested for everything, if we did all the possible tests, we'd find something wrong in every single person. And in the majority of cases, we'd find things that don't really need to be treated. In the meantime, we'd have exposed the person to anxiety, 
radiation, physical trauma, and spent enough money to break the Australian healthcare system. A key point here is that in making a diagnosis, symptoms provide us the place to start. So we don't end up going down the wrong track when there are so many possible tracks. You actually have a chance of finding that needle in the haystack if you actually know which corner of the haystack to look. So what's the other side of diagnosis? What if there is no effective treatment or treatment's not very effective? What if the treatment causes harm? Nothing is 100% safe, whether it's natural or not. Doing nothing and doing something are all associated with possible risks and benefits. What if knowing the diagnosis causes harm? When we know we've got a disease, we think and behave differently. We might worry more, get anxious about the future, wonder who's going to take care of the kids or our dog, and what might happen to our bodies. That might stop us from doing the things we enjoy. What if it was going to get better anyway? And what if treatment was never going to make a difference? Those questions are even more important when deciding to test people who are well. Up till now, I've been talking about testing people who have a symptom. They have a reason to want to be tested. In population screening, we look for early disease in people with no symptoms. And if we're going to mess about with a well population, we need to know that the benefit of detecting disease is greater than the harm. We need to know that we can test effectively, that we can treat effectively, that we have good evidence. How many lives will be saved? How much improvement in quality of life? And at the cost of what harm? Then we need to think, can we afford this as a society? Because in a world of limited resources, everything that we choose to do means something else that we can't afford to do. I want to explain something called lead time bias, because this is an important trap that we can fall into when we aim to detect disease early. Let's say we've got a disease that starts at the age of 20 and causes symptoms at the age of 40 and the person dies at the age of 50. The perceived survival time is 10 years. So that's what happens if the disease was detected by symptoms. Let's say we develop a test that detects this disease earlier, at the age of 30. And imagine that the person still has symptoms at 40 and dies at 50. We now think that the person has survived 20 years because we diagnosed it earlier. So we could get very excited and think the test and the early treatment has doubled the survival time from 10 to 20 years. But really, nothing has changed. All we've done is told the person 10 years earlier that they've got the disease. They, don't, they haven't lived any longer. They've just lived longer knowing they've got the disease. That's lead time bias. It makes it look like people who are screened lived longer. So that's a trap we watch for when we interpret research. And so when we look at whether or not screening has worked, we don't just look at five-year survival rates. We look at the age of death and make sure that it's not lead time bias that's leading us on. So what's overdiagnosis? It's the diagnosis of a disease that ultimately will not cause us symptoms in our lifetimes and won't kill us. There's a spectrum of health, a gray area between health and disease. We're all different. At what point do we get classed as abnormal? How we define a disease will determine if we're considered to be sick or not. How tall do you have to be before you're abnormally tall? What I'm talking about is not misdiagnosis, which means wrong diagnosis. What I'm talking about relates to over-medicalization, over-treatment, diagnosis creep. In other words, classifying healthy people with mild symptoms or mild problems as lo or low risk as sick. A really good example is that of the menopause, a normal life stage. Some people certainly do experience problems and need treatment, but many do not. And yet, I see women every week who come in 
worried because they're well. They're around the menopausal age. They're not supposed to be well. There must be something wrong. How crazy is that? Now, overdiagnosis doesn't just apply to doctors. There are many other providers. For example, naturopaths might tell patients to test for hormones or for your blood type. There's a whole industry out there ready to gain from people being classified as needing their treatment without evidence of benefit. With all the tests that we have, it's common to find things that we were never meant to find. It's what we call an incidental finding, something that you happen to see while you were looking for something else. In medicine, when we find a lump, we add the suffix oma to it. So a fibroma is a fibrous lump. It's a fancy name for a lump, but fancy names make us feel really clever. So from this, we've developed a new word, the incidental loma. <laughs> it's a real word. It's used in medicine. You look it up. You'll see it in the journals. These are lumps that are found when we weren't meant to be looking for a lump. So how, how common are incidental lomas? Well, let's see. Everyone's heard of CT scans. They're basically doing loads and loads of x-rays, putting them together so that we get a kind of 3D image. People often think that a whole body scan would be a great thing to do, pick disease up early and do something about it. Now, if we were to do a whole body scan of everybody who's here, what do you think we would find? Furtado and colleagues in the US did a study of just that. A study of 1,200 people who had a whole body CT scan, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And here's what they found. If you look at the bottom axis here, that's age. And here, that's the percentage of people. The blue line shows people with at least one abnormality. Now, for those of you who are over the age of 70, I'm sorry, the bad news is that if you were in that group, it would have a 99% chance of actually having an abnormality. And before those of you who are between 50 and 59 look so smug, your chances are 93%. And it's only those of you who are under 40 that have any reason to smile, because yours is about 43%, I think. And that's still pretty high, isn't it? But the good news is, some of the time, when we say an abnormality, it's very obvious. It's not much of an abnormality. So we might see a little bit of arthritis, a little tiny cyst that's obviously nothing that we need to do anything about. But look at the green line. The green line is the number of people or the percentage of people that were told, um, we found something and we need to do another scan and another test to make sure that it's OK, right? So based on those statistics, 85% of you would be told that you had an abnormal scan in this room, and one in three of you would be told that you need another test. Look at the person on your left and the person on your right, one of the three of you would be told you needed another test just to make sure that you're okay and that you're not going to die. There are many cancers and diseases that we will go to our graves with without ever knowing about. At this point, there is no evidence that doing full body CT scans in well people does any good. It may harm, as radiation can lead to cancers. So let's move on to testing. In a perfect world, all tests would be 100% accurate. That means they'd be 100% specific. Yes always means yes. A positive test means you definitely have the disease. There is no doubt there are no false positives. It would be 100% sensitive. That means a no is always no. A negative test means there is no chance you've got the disease and there are no false negatives. There would be no side effects. We would have an immediate answer. There would be no need to wait, no stress, easy to interpret and easy to understand. There would be no cost or little cost and we would have clear proof that testing saves lives or improves quality of life. We would know from the research exactly how long before we need to test it again. Welcome to the real world. We're talking about human beings here. And you have to handle human beings with care. Looking inside properly is not possible without causing people harm. So when we do tests, we use approximations. We don't usually take the brain out, squeeze it, prod it, and put it back in again and expect it to function. Instead, we take pictures from the outside and we might inject something into the blood to try and enhance the image so we can see better. Tests are getting better, but 
they're still not perfect. Every test is associated with potential harm, even if it's only anxiety. So we target tests at the people that we can make the biggest difference to. In other words, the people who are at the highest likelihood of having the disease. And we limit radiation exposure and invasiveness wherever we can. Let me show you what I mean. Imagine that we wanted to set up a test for deciding, for detecting which one of you is going to have a car accident in the next five years. We don't have a crystal ball, so we're going to have to make the best of the test that we've got, okay? Some possible tests might be the ability to park a car without scratching it, the ability to reverse park, whether you talk on the mobile phone while driving, whether you sing in the car, being male or female. Now, I know there are lots of myths about women drivers, but the intelligent among you, of course, know that women are far less likely to have car accidents and therefore are better drivers. For the fun of it, let's use singing in the car. So we've set up microphones in all of your cars and we're going to record whether you sing in the next three months. And yes, you did sign that consent form on the way in. And yes, we know exactly where you did park your car. We then fast forward to the year 2020, where we now know how many of you had car accidents in the last five years. And we also have recordings from 2015. And we know exactly how many of you sang in the car. And we, we have recordings, so we know exactly how well you sang too, but that's another story. So here's what the results might look like. The bottom axis shows the number of times you sang in the car. And here are the number of people who sang that number of times. The blue plot now shows all the people who didn't have a car accident. And then we can also plot all the people who did have a car accident. And as you can see, look, this test might actually work because there's a bit of a difference between them and we can say, look, the people who had a car accident actually on average sang more than the people who didn't have a car accident. So let's see how we go with the test. Well, if we're going to design a test, we have to decide which is positive and negative. So it's a bit arbitrary, but let's put a line down here. And so everybody who's on the right of that line, in other words, anybody who's saying 100 times or more, is positive for the test. The test now predicts that you're going to have a car accident in the next five years. So did that work? Well, the red line is all the people who had the car accident. See that the... the the red line, and the majority of them tested positive, so hey, this might work. Bit of a problem though, because of that overlap, there's a group of people who didn't have a car accident, so the people in the blue, some of them sang a little bit too much and ended up getting tested for positive, right? And so the test predicted they would have a car accident, but they didn't have a car accident. So they're the false alarms, the false positives. So let's look at the people who tested negative. In the blue, on the left, the people who sang less than 100 times, so it predicted that they wouldn't have a car accident. And they were right most of the time. They were true negatives in most cases. But there were also false negatives. There were some people under the red line who had a car accident, but they sang too little, and so they tested negative. And so the test actually predicted wrong it gave them false reassurance because they actually did have a car accident, right? So, you might think that this example that I've made up is a bit silly, but you know what? In the real world, tests are like this. Things usually do overlap. In almost all tests, there is an overlap in results and there are always false positives and false negatives. Anyone who tells you that they have a test that is 100% accurate is either ignorant or lying. Then there's the other problem of knowing. What do we do with knowledge? As technology becomes more sophisticated, we find more and more abnormalities. We have an illusion that we can detect everything and prevent everything. The reality is that when we find an abnormality in someone who's well, often we don't really know what that means. Some things are going to get better on their own. Some will stay the same, not cause any problems in our lifetimes, and others will get worse. And often we can't predict which ones. But once we know, it changes everything. We have a duty to act. We have to do something. So we go on to a cycle of monitoring, having more tests in the future, 
Knowledge can be stressful, increasing our uncertainties about life. I have a patient whose husband had a scan for an unrelated reason, and they found a tiny aortic aneurysm. Now, the aorta is this huge artery here. It's un it works under high pressure, and he had a little weakness, a little ballooning out, tiny, tiny, in that blood vessel. And he was told that if it bursts, he's got a 90% chance of dying. That's pretty serious. But the good news was that it, the chance of it bursting is only about 1% every year. Okay, so maybe he should have an operation to get rid of it so he doesn't have to face that 90% chance. But there's a catch, the operation to fix it. 10% chance of dying in the operation. So what should he do? Hmm, tricky. In his case, he's got some other really serious medical conditions that will actually get to him long before this one does. So, was it worth him knowing? Well, if he were a smoker, it would have been, because by stopping smoking, he could have reduced that risk a lot. But in his case, he stopped smoking a long time ago, and there is nothing more he can do to reduce his risk. The knowledge has had a huge impact on the family. My patient says that she expects a time bomb to go off any time, and the, the whole family worries every time he gets up from a chair or carries a cup of tea. So if we're going to do a test, we need to think about what we might find, what we would do if we found an abnormality, and proceed only if we believe we're more likely to do good than harm by doing the test. Let's go to thyroid cancer in the Republic of Korea, South Korea. The thyroid gland is here in the neck, just above the cut that you can see in the picture. It controls our metabolism. It makes thyroid hormone, which we need to survive. South Korea has a very high standard of living and the world's fastest internet connection speed. Eat your heart out, Australia. This is the land of Samsung, LG, and Hyundai. In 1999, the government funded a national screening program for cancers, and for a small fee, many providers added an ultrasound for thyroid cancer. The result is what was what you could describe as an explosion of thyroid cancer, with a 15 times increase of diagnosis over a period of 18 years and a huge surge in the number of cases of thyroid surgery. What was going on? Were they saving lives or detecting false alarms? If there had been a real increase in cancer, you would expect a reduction in deaths from cancer. There were no reductions in deaths. For every 100 people with thyroid cancer diagnosed, there was one death, and the tumours they were removing were getting smaller and smaller. It seems they were detecting incidental lomas. Guidelines actually say that small tumours in the thyroid should not be followed up and not be operated on, yet many people chose to have the operation. That's the problem with knowledge. If I told you you had a cancer right here in your neck, and that I've decided we're going to sit on it and do nothing, and I want you to just ignore it, okay? What would you do? Would you be able to forget it? Or would you wake up at night and go, <gasps> it's stopping me from breathing, and start worrying? Or would you keep checking it, squeezing it, making it itch and bruised and swollen and painful and making it worse? Or would you prefer to take it out? The problem is that surgery is also associated with harms. Nearly everybody would have to take a hormone and have blood tests for the rest of their lives because of that thyroid hormone that the thyroid gland was producing. And there are also some other delicate structures in that area with the parathyroid gland being really important for life too, so needing to take other medicines and tests if, if you ended up injuring that. And then there's this little nerve that goes to your vocal cords so that if that got injured, you might not be able to talk very well. So that's over-diagnosis and over-treatment. But we live in the lucky country, and this wouldn't happen here, or would it? Thyroid cancer is now the fastest growing cancer in Australia. The five-year survival rate of thyroid cancer is 96%. From the graph, you can see the top line, females, getting thyroid cancer. That's the diagnosis. You can see that over the years, it's increased. The second line is men with thyroid cancer. So we're picking up more females with thyroid cancer. Now, that could be because we look at our necks a little bit more, we're a bit more observant, or because we go to doctors more, I don't really know. But the really important thing is those two lines at the bottom. 
That's the rate of death. That hasn't changed. We've increased the number of cases we're detecting and no change in death. So we're getting a little bit of overdiagnosis here. What's happening? In Australia, we've got no routine ultrasound screening like in South Korea. But if we find a lump, of course we investigate. Why is diagnosis increasing? I think people are becoming more aware of lumps and the need to seek help. That's a good thing, but with every good thing comes a bad thing. Doctors are more concerned that they might miss something. The test is easy to order. The big C, cancer, is a very scary word and everyone involved gets worried. So as patients, we need to ask questions about the evidence. As doctors, we have to communicate well with patients so that we can help them make the best decisions. And as a community, we need to watch this space and be careful we don't follow in the steps of South Korea. Now, I want to put all that in the context of cancer in Australia. By the age of 75, one in three men and one in four women will have cancer. And that just keeps going up as we get older. That's why I'm staying 30. We want to obviously detect it as early as possible and treat and prevent death if we can. But as you can see before, if we're over enthusiastic, without the evidence, we can cause more harm than good. The good news is that living with cancer is now becoming more common. We have increasing survival rates with cancer and many, many people in the community who are cancer survivors. And the highest survivor cancers are testicular, thyroid, lip, prostate, melanoma, and breast. Now I'm going to talk about prostate and breast because they're the most common ones in men and women. Let's start with prostate. It's the most common cancer in men so that one in five men who get to the age of 85 will have prostate cancer. So that's really high. That means that lots of people here will have prostate cancer. There is a test. It's called the PSA. Why aren't we promoting it when it's just a simple blood test? Because the PSA is a great example of an imperfect test with false positives and false negatives. We can't even agree on what a normal level really is. And we can't make a diagnosis from that PSA. We actually have to do another test. The PSA just gives us a bit of an idea, a risk, and then we have to do a test called a biopsy. That's the definitive test. And that means we need to take a sample from the prostate. Now, this involves putting an instrument into the anus or the back passage and sticking a needle in. Now, it's not the kind of procedure that most people look forward to. But if it helps to avoid death from cancer, what's wrong with a little discomfort? because it might not save any lives or improve quality of life. This has been really controversial because the idea that early detection is better is so ingrained. We think, surely it can't be true. Surely we must be able to do better if we can detect it early. The problems are that prostate cancer is often slow growing. It happens in people who are getting older and who have heart disease, diabetes and other conditions which will get to them first. The tests also don't tell us which of the early cases will grow or not, and the treatment can cause side effects. And there's not much evidence that treatments will save lives. Uh, not treatment, sorry, that, that testing will save lives. You can see from this graph, the top line is the number of cases of prostate cancer. And we started testing for more prostate cancer, so that's the first peak. And then it kind of fell out of favour and then it started to come back up again. But the line below is death. And you'll see there's not much difference. There's been a slow decline in death, as with almost every cancer, because treatments are getting better. I'm going to show you in a different picture. This is a complex one, so I'll only deal with one side at a time. This diagram comes from the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners and is based on the review of the latest research and guidelines from the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia. On the left side of the screen, you'll see what happens to 1,000 men between the ages of 55 and 69 who do not have any testing. These are men in the community who over 11 years will be monitored. 
55 of them will get symptoms and will go to see their GP who will ask them questions and examine them and then eventually make a diagnosis of prostate cancer. These men will still be alive at the end of 11 years living with prostate cancer. 190 men will die from some other cause, from heart disease, strokes, other cancers. And five will die from prostate cancer. Five out of 1,000 men will die from prostate cancer without any testing. On the right side of the screen, you'll see what happens if we screen for prostate cancer with a blood test every single year for, for that time, okay? 87 men will have false alarms. That is, the prostate cancer test, the PSA test, will tell them that they might have prostate cancer. They need to come back and have that biopsy. And when they have that biopsy, they'll get the happy news that they don't have prostate cancer. So it was a false alarm, a false positive. But 28 of them will end up with a side effect from the biopsy that they consider to be major. And that includes things like pain, bleeding, bowel problems, infections, and even having to be admitted to hospital. 37 of them will have slow-growing cancers that don't need treatment. That's what we call overdiagnosis. 25 will choose treatment anyway, because for them, they've decided that the uncertainty about whether the cancer will grow is worse. Many of them don't need treatment, so this is over-treatment. Seven to 10 of them will get side effects from treatment, like urine incontinence, difficulty with erections, bowel problems, blood loss from transfusion, pneumonia, and even cardiac problems. As with the other group, 55 would get symptoms and will be living with cancer at the end of the 11 years. 190 will die from some other cause, like heart disease. Four men will die from prostate cancer, even though they were screened. That's because screening can't pick up all cancers. It's actually better at picking up the slow-growing cancers than the fast ones, because the fast ones, when they come along in between the screening period, develop really quickly, and we can't pick those up easily. And even if you get the right diagnosis and you get it early, no treatment is 100% effective. So you will still get some deaths. So four out of 100 men in the screened group will still die from prostate cancer. And one man will be saved by doing testing. So one out of 1,000 men will be saved. Was it worth it? Well, it depends if you or someone in your family was that one man. The problem is we don't know who that one man will be and who will be the ones who will have all those problems from testing and treatment. So for every one life saved out of 1,000, we have 35 to 38 harmed and 37 unnecessarily diagnosed and living with a knowledge of cancer. So we're not there yet. We have no effective screening tool. So if that's the reason that we don't widely promote population screening, it's not because we're anti-men. But I'm not saying forget about testing. It is a personal choice. And anyone with a family history or symptoms, such as problems passing water or blood in the urine, should definitely talk with their doctor because that changes the risk. But for population screening of the well person, there is no benefit versus, the, the benefit versus harm. It just doesn't support testing at the moment. Let's go to a very different cancer, ovarian cancer. This is a very rare cancer. Compared with the one in five with men, we've got one out of 120 women who will have ovarian cancer before the age of 75. From the graph, you'll see it's not common, but the likelihood of death is high. So these are the number of people who've had it, and these are the number of people who've died over the years. So why aren't we screening for it? Well, let's start with the symptoms. The most common symptoms are bloating, tiredness, abdominal, pelvic, and back pain, weight gain, reduced appetite, heartburn, and frequent urination. I bet there are not many women in this room without at least one of those symptoms in the last three months. If we take bloating alone, it's estimated that 3.8 million women in Australia right now would experience frequent bloating. Millions of women with symptoms and a small number who develop ovarian cancer. But Dr. Google tells lots of women that they might have ovarian cancer. 
and suggests that they ask their GPs for a screening test like the CA125. A simple blood test, just like the PSA. Why aren't we promoting that? Well, there are many false alarms. When it's positive, it's usually not because of ovarian cancer. And it gives a lot of false reassurance as well, because 50% of women with ovarian cancer have a negative CA125. It's also not good at telling the difference between a cancer lump and a non-cancer lump. So what about genetic testing? Also very popular with Dr. Google. There is a myth that cancer is all about inherited genes. The majority of cancer is not inherited. Remember the graph I showed you about cancer increasing with age? The body is this amazing machine. What other machine do you know lives 100 years? We're able to repair ourselves again and again. But even though it's an amazing machine, it wears out over time. And errors develop on the gene code. So what we, we get what we call mutations. And with those mutations, we get cancer. So it's actually more about age than it's about inheritance. And age is the biggest risk factor. And we don't need a test to tell us how old we are. Angelina Jolie made the inherited, BRCA, uh, inherited genes, the, the gene faults, BRCA1 and BRCA2, famous. But only one in 20 cases of ovarian and breast cancer involve these. So for the normal population, genetic testing does not help. So at the moment, we have no useful screening tools for the healthy population. All the tools we have have high false positives, can lead to unnecessary surgery and complications, and there is no evidence that screening reduces death. But if someone in the family has a history of ovarian cancer, that's a very different story. Or symptoms, if you have symptoms that don't go away, it's a different story. Go and talk to your GP because you need that systematic approach. Now I'm going to go to the most common cancer in women, breast cancer. One in eight women in our lifetimes will get this. We've had a population screening program in Australia since the early 90s. You can see from the graph that the number of cancers detected went up after screening was introduced. And the death rate has come down a little. So what's the problem? The number of advanced cancers and death rate hasn't come down as much as we would have expected if we were really picking up the type of cancer that kills. The increases in survival are probably mostly from the improvements in treatment. There is something called DCIS, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is an early form of breast cancer that might or might not get worse. Mammograms are very good at picking up DCIS. So there's a lot of discussion among the experts at the moment about screening, DCIS, and overdiagnosis. The problem is we don't know which ones of these ones that we pick up will progress to become the type of cancer we fear and which ones will not. Right now, I believe the benefits of screening outweigh the harms, but only marginally. So it is a personal choice to screen or not to screen. I'm watching this space. It's important that as clinicians and scientists, we have an open mind. We watch the evidence. We ask ourselves if we need to change. And we give the advice based on the best evidence that we have at the time. But all the time, we need to keep asking questions. This is a graphic from Breast Cancer Now in the UK, and it captures the current knowledge well. The image illustrates 200 women who have screening or no screening. With screening mammograms, you diagnose and treat more women. You can save one life per 200 over three years. But this is at the cost of treating three women who didn't need to be treated. If we compare that to the 1,000 cases that we used in the prostate cancer diagram and multiply the numbers to make it similar over 11 years, you would have 18 lives saved per 1,000 at the cost of 55 women being overtreated. Is it worth the risk of overtreatment to save the 18 lives? Governments have made the decision that your lives are valuable and have funded the program. But the individual then needs to make their own decision about whether to take the risk of overtreatment. Research suggests that many women who know the risks of overtreatment would still prefer to be screened, but it's their choice. It's like insurance. 
We all know that insurance companies make more money from us than we make from them. And yet, often, we choose to get insurance, just in case. As before, these stats are talking about the well population. If you have a family history of breast cancer or you have symptoms like a lump or bleeding, you should seek medical advice. I hope I've shown you in these few examples that testing is a complicated business. It's very easy to draw the wrong conclusions if you look at things superficially. There is uncertainty. It's very easy to look back with hindsight and say that we should have made a different decision. We have to make the decisions with the facts that we have at the time without the benefit of knowing the future. An area of research I'm really interested in is the interaction between doctors and patients and the different expectations that each have. I lead a team that gives medical advice to the Health and Disability Services Complaints Office, and as part of that, we review some of the complaints. One of the recurring themes is that of patients being concerned that the test should have been done earlier. Yet in most cases, the doctors had followed the guidelines. The right thing is to use the structured process, ruling out the more common things before going on to do the rarer ones, and not doing too many tests in the beginning. That way, we avoid the complications from over-testing and over-diagnosis. But to me, this highlights a mismatch of expectations, a communication issue that we have to keep working on, that we need to improve. The community has changed a lot in the 30 years since I graduated. People are clearly saying they want to know more. There is increasing health literacy, and people expect to take part in decision making. I think that's fabulous because, in my view, patients who understand their disease, their medications and tests, are much more likely to get safer and higher quality care. Doctors have changed too. I think there's more of a patient-centered approach. And I believe the feminization of the workforce has contributed a great deal to improving communication in medicine. But I'm biased, of course. The art of medicine is about understanding and communicating effectively to share decision making, not only empowering for the patient, but also very helpful for the healthcare provider. So the skill in medicine is not just in the science, but also the art of communication, dealing with our own fear of missing the early signs of disease, our own fear of litigation, our own fear of Medicare prosecuting us for doing too many tests. And yes, that really does happen. Always putting the patient's back best interests in the centre. And then the hardest part, communicating the uncertainty in an honest but reassuring way. Now that really is an art. I don't really know the answer, but trust me, I'm a doctor. Over-testing, over-diagnosis, over-medicalising and over-treatment. I'd like to put all this in the context of the things that we can do. Early detection is good. It's worth doing where there's evidence that it works. I don't want you to get the impression that testing is bad. There is good evidence for doing tests when symptoms and signs suggest it should be done. There is good evidence to support screening tests like pap smears and bowel cancer screening. Some of you will have reached that magic age where you were sent that kit for the bowel cancer screening program. And some of you might have put it away in some drawer somewhere. If you haven't yet done it, when you go home, take it out and just do it. It might save your life. Besides, how often do you get an invitation to send your poo in an envelope to government? <laughs> screening that works is worth doing. We need to change the things that we can. There's a lot that we still don't understand about disease and testing. So we should contribute to knowledge through teaching and research. And I think we should have honest conversations about what we don't know and what we're fearful of. Prevention is better than detection. I don't need a clever test to tell you now that we are all going to die one day. Every single one of us. If I had a test that told you with 100% certainty that you have the human condition from which you were going to die, what would you do? I can tell you now that there is a very effective treatment for the human condition and that you can do a lot to prevent disease and delay death now. These things 
can reduce cancer and heart disease and most of the major killers enormously. Not smoking, limiting alcohol, exercising, eating well, being mentally healthy and enjoying life. While we can do what we can to improve our knowledge and our health, we have to accept our human limitations and accept that life is uncertain. We shouldn't just focus on disease in the precious time we have on Earth. We should put everything in perspective and focus on the important things in life. We should spend time with those who matter to us and do things of value. Lastly, I'd like to talk about the role of general practice here. Those of us who love general practice really value this long-term two-way relationship that facilitates trust and honest communication. It's an enormous privilege to share in people's lives and to guide them in healthcare. Research shows that people who have a long-term GP get better health care and better health outcomes. Iona Heath, a prominent GP in the UK, once quoted a mentor who said that in hospitals, diseases, come, diseases stay and patients come and go. In general practice, patients stay and diseases come and go. So how does that relate to over-testing, over-diagnosis and over-treatment? I hope I've shown you why, in our high-tech world, we should not put all our trust in technology. There is a great value in low-tech human thinking about the whole person and the situation, using history and examination and communication. In making decisions to test for disease, there are complex issues to, dis to consider. We have to start with the human being, the individual, their values and their needs. Your GP has a role in your healthcare regardless of whether you are sick or well. Your GP is not likely to gain from testing or medicines. That is, they don't own pathology companies or pharmacies. Your GP is therefore in the best position to guide you in, your, in that decision making. Our decisions are based in science wrapped around the human being. The challenge for doctors is in communicating those complex messages well, and this means talking about the limits of our knowledge and the limits of medicine, the myths that we can prevent everything, and the myths that we have certainty in everything. Having a long-term partnership with a trusted family doctor means you can have the honest discussions about the grey parts of medicine. The last quote I'd like to leave you with is one of my favourite quotes about general practice. GPs are the only group that don't define themselves by a part of the body or a type of test. Instead, they're defined by the patient and whatever the patient brings into the consultation. I haven't covered everything here in this huge topic, but I have a strict time limit after which I turn into a pumpkin. I've used some diseases to illustrate my points, and I've included a handout, as I hope you found this interesting enough to read some more. In summary, early diagnosis is a worthy goal, where there is evidence that benefit outweighs harm. Overtesting can lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment and harm. Shared decision-making processes can improve the quality of care. Always ask questions. It's your health care and you should be in the driver's seat regardless of whether you sing or not when you drive.